This conference is about suffering uh, and the sovereignty of God. Um, it's a topic that was picked um, in God's providence um, more than a year ago uh, when we were looking at our conferences for 2010. And um, in God's timing, obviously this is a very appropriate subject right now. You cannot but turn on the news and see heart-wrenching images and hear uh, devastating stories of what has gone on in Haiti. And obviously this was on uh, many of your minds as uh, we received your questions tonight. And so let's, uh, let's begin our, our time together in a question and answer session talking about the theology of suffering um, with obviously Haiti as a backdrop. Um, <clears throat> where was God when the earthquake happened, Dr. Sproul? I don't think there was any time in my life that I heard that question more frequently than <clears throat> after 9-11. And the question was, where was God on 9-11? And I didn't mean to be flip, but I said the same place He was on 9-10 and 9-12. He is the Lord God omnipotent who reigns and governs all things. He is the one who brings wheel. He's the one who visits this planet with woe. And that is, to me, the, the greatest comfort is, I'm sure Derek was preaching out of Romans 8, that in, in the most apparently tragic circumstances and painful experiences that we have, to know that God is sovereign over them is really our only hope. If these things happen merely by accident or fortuitous events of the cosmos, then we have no hope. But it just so happens that the God we worship is the God who's not only sovereign over all these things, but He has the power to redeem all of these things. And He majors in suffering. That's one of the things we'll be looking at in this conference. Many non-believers struggle with this, this doctrine and wondering, you know, if you Christians say that, that God is good, how could He allow such evil? How, how would you begin to, to answer that? And I'd like to hear from both of you on this. Dr. Thomas? I always think this question needs to be asked um, the other way around. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a world where there is almost no conception of sin. There's a conception of evil, but there is no conception of, of sin. And the question often is asked in such a way that the, the issues of sin fallenness, justice, judgment, all of those issues are, are bypassed. You know, for Christians, the greater question is, why does God put up with this world? Um, you know, why is this world not consumed? Now, the, the world out there doesn't understand that perspective. It's, it's, it's when you come to realize that all of us are sinners and we live in a sinful, broken world. And Dr. Sproul's final message on, on holiness, um, you know, outside of a conception of God's purity and God's holiness, n none of these questions can begin to make sense. We, we live in a fallen world. We, we live in a world that, that is under the curse. It's a broken world. And saints and sinners alike live in that world. And therefore, <coughs> hurt, damage, um, great acts of terrible destruction happen in this broken world that affect saints and sinners alike. Um, why, does, why does God um, allow evil 
Because I think evil is part of the fabric of what it means to to live in this fallen world. Um, The greater and much more profound question is, how can God overcome evil? Uh, how, How can redemption be found in the midst of evil? Those are, those are much more profound um, questions to me. Well, this question came to our Lord, obviously, in the, in the midst of tragic episodes that were almost insignificant when you compare them with what has happened in Haiti, but the people came and asked Jesus about the ghastly attack where <clears throat> Pilate's soldiers uh, invaded the temporary and mix the blood of the, of the sacrifices and of the people with their offerings in the Galilee, and also about this temple that had fallen down and fell on people's heads that were just minding their own business and killed 18 or 19 people walking down the street. And when Jesus was asked about that, He basically answered it by saying, unless you repent, you all likewise perish, which was an indirect way of saying to the people, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not why did the temple fall down on those people's head, but why didn't it fall on my head? That's, that's the biggest question I can't get over, is, well, is the question of the depths of God's grace. We're not amazed by it anymore. We expect it, we require it, we demand it. And if we ever get anything less than a blessing, then we protest against the injustice of God. After 9-11, you saw bumper stickers everywhere saying, God bless America. But as soon as anybody suggested that such an action could have been a thinly veiled judgment of God upon us, people shrunk back in horror from such a conclusion. Because evidently we believe in a God who is capable of blessing us but incapable of judging us. You can't have it both ways. If God raises nations up and God raises, brings them down, if He brings calamity, if He brings prosperity, as Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And we're supposed to learn something about our dependence upon His grace from these things. The final thing I want to say about this is for the pagan, every benefit and every blessing that that person receives from the hand of God is undeserved and is designed to lead them to gratitude and to repentance. But our fundamental sin is a refusal to acknowledge the greatness of God or to be grateful. And so all the good things that He gives to us, the unbeliever despises, takes for granted. And so those blessings become tragedies. And if Romans 8 is true, and we believe it is, then ultimately for the Christian there's no such thing as a tragedy. If it's really true that that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose, it doesn't mean that everything that happens in and of itself is good, but God in His sovereign power has the ability to make every tragedy that we experience an ultimate blessing. And that's the hope that we have as Christians. Where does evil come from? Oakland. Oakland. <laughs> Oakland, California. Is there a football team there? And any Steeler fan knows that. That's where. <laughs> Next? Okay. <laughs> Was that a serious question? (laughs) It obviously comes from us. Uh, God doesn't do evil. He's not the author of evil. But no evil could come into this world apart from His sovereign uh, government over it. And so if God even allows me to sin when He could prevent me, He knows what I'm going to do before I do it. He has the power and the right to vaporize me before I ever sin. If He chooses to let it happen, 
In a certain sense, as Augustine says, He has ordained it. My intentions would be for evil, just as was the case of Joseph's brothers. Their design, their intentionality was evil from the beginning, but yet God in His sovereignty and His providence was working through that evil, and He's, as Joseph said, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And that God, that God does and can bring good out of evil is seen most, uh, most beautifully in the cross. The cross was the most evil event in the history of this planet, and yet it was the singular, the most redemptive event in the history of the planet. Yes. Um, <coughs> Peter says on the day of Pentecost about the cross, um, you with wicked hands took and slew him, and yet it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Both things are true. They were responsible for it, a wicked act, and yet it was all by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. E evil is part of God's decree, but it is not something that He authors. He, he doesn't bring it into being. Um, now, there may be a sense in which we're just playing with words, but what's, what's the alternative? Um, you know, people, people have always shied away from God and from theism because of evil. Um, Dostoevsky in, in The Brothers Karamazov has a very gripping passage um, where um, a question is asked about um, torturing a little girl and, and what, what, kind of, what kind of God would allow that to happen. And that's just an, that's one of, of many, many examples. And, and the same question has been raised, I'm sure, in respect to the horrific events of, of Haiti. But what's, what's the alternative? You know, some of us have members of the family who have um, had terrible things happen. Um, a loved one has died. Maybe a, a child has died, and they've, they've given up faith in God. But what have they given that up for? What, what, is, it, what is the alternative that's better? Um, that God isn't in charge, is that better? That God is hamstrung at evil. You've been at funerals where, a, a terrible funeral, and, and, and the minister said, you know, God wasn't there. God had his back turned to this. Don't, don't blame God because God wasn't there. And I don't find that remotely comforting, that you can, that you can drive up I-55 And in between Books a Million and Walmart, God isn't in control. You know, there, there are gaps in His sovereignty. I, I don't find that remotely, certainly not on I-55, I don't find that remotely comforting. Um, Someone has said there's no maverick molecule. Is that what you're saying? R right. And, and, and I think that um, from a Christian perspective, I think we must always look at evil from the perspective of, of the cross that here is, here is God's conquering of evil. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a triumph over them openly in, in the cross. Um, that, that this most despicable and evil of acts was something that God overruled redemptively. Um, that good does triumph over evil. Because if, if the presence and existence of evil makes me question the, the existence of God, then I have no means of affirming that good will triumph over evil. Um, that, that's, that's the, that, that is the blessedness of the Christian gospel. Um, 
uh, of the book of Revelation, that, that not only in his power and sovereignty, but in his, in his redemptive love, he triumphs over all evil. One of the important things that Augustine <clears throat> pointed out about this question is that there can be no real understanding of the meaning of evil except against the backdrop of the good, because evil by definition is parasitic. It needs the host to survive. It's always defined in terms of negation or privation. Evil's the lack of the good. It's unrighteousness, ungodliness, and so on. And it, it depends upon the positive for its very definition. So that people who are unbelievers because of evil have twice the problems we have, because they have to account for good by which they make a definition or a problem with evil, as Derek said in the Brothers Karamazov and Dostoevsky's idea, is if God doesn't exist, neither does evil, because you can't really make that judgment about anything. The universe becomes amoral, and what we call the good is merely a personal preference. After the current earthquake tragedy in Haiti, some have said it is God's judgment. Uh, on those people, uh, how would the believing Christian community answer that opinion? I didn't hear the question. Is Haiti a judgment of God? I don't know. It may be. I wouldn't. Know, I wouldn't rule that possibility out. But this is this is one of the lessons of Job, where our colleague here is an expert on that book, and that the problem when John eight, when they bring the man born blind to Jesus, and they say. Whose sin was it, this man or his parents, that he's been brought blind? And he said, be careful there. You can't draw that conclusion that people in this world suffer in direct proportion to their sinfulness. Again, if that were the case, we would have had that earthquake here a long time ago. But at the same time, God may visit His judgment in that way to one nation, withhold it from another. And, and the fact is that we can't jump to the conclusion that it was God's judgment on the Haitians for any particular reason or particular sin. But we can't escape the possibility that this was a divine judgment on this particular nation because He does do that. He judges nations. He judges peoples. And I wish that we would realize that because we're so ripe for it here that if we keep denying the possibility that God judges nations, then we come blind to the warning signals that are all around us for our own country. You speak, Dr. Sproul, of suffering as a vocation. Suffering as a vocation. What do you mean by that? Well, when we usually talk about vocation, the word simply means a calling. And we usually think of it in terms of our life's work, our ministry, our career path or whatever. Some is, someone may be called to be a doctor, some may be called to be a farmer, somebody may be called to be a, a minister, and so on. And I believe that my vocation in this world is to be a teacher of the truths of God. However, tomorrow afternoon, that vocation may end where I may be visited by a uh, terminal illness or de de uh, de de a, a, an incapacitating disease that prohibits me from carrying on uh, that normal vocation that I have. And uh, it may be that my new vocation now is to die, and to die with grace. and in submission and in glory and praise to God who holds my life in His hand every day. Uh, when people are deemed to be terminally ill, there are certain patterns of emotions typically that they go through, you know, denial and shock and anger and sadness and all the rest, and then sometimes a, 
finally an acceptance. But again, the idea is if I'm in that situation, then I know that God has called me to that. And that's comforting, that I'm not just a, 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 an accident waiting to be uh, snuffed out with my life, no. And so, God calls each one of us to live for Him and to die for Him. And when I say suffering, you look, at, look at Johnny Erickson Tata. I mean, how many people do you know that suffered as long, as much as she has? And yet, she has really understood her life of suffering as a vocation, that she lives to the glory of God and to the comfort of other people. That's what I mean. Colossians 1.24 says, now, rejoice, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, that is, the church of which I became a minister. Could you please explain this verse? Uh, I think that verse is a very important verse. Uh, <clears throat> the Roman Catholic Church has classically understood that text in Colossians as giving definition to the, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, as the continuing incarnation, and that uh, the suffering of Christ, as important as it was, was not completed and needs to be completed by the apostles and by the saints whose sufferings are meritorious enough to add merit to the treasury of merits by which people who are in purgatory can uh, borrow from that merit in order to get to heaven. So you have a whole salvific system, soteriological system based on the idea of the church's meritorious suffering that completes or fulfills what was started by Jesus. And uh, of course, the Protestant Reformation uh, rejected that completely. And the understanding of the Protestant community to Paul's statement in Colossians, as is consistent with what he teaches throughout his epistles, is that every Christian is baptized into the death as well as does the resurrection of Jesus. And we are called to participate in His humiliation. In fact, we are told if we're not willing to participate in the humiliation and in the sufferings of Jesus, then we won't ever participate in His exaltation. And so, it's not that there was any meritorious lack in the suffering of Jesus, but simply the reality that those in whom Jesus dwells participate in His humiliation, participate in His suffering. We embrace His suffering, but not in the sense that we bring merit to it or there, there's any intrinsic value that can be added to other people's lock, a, a lack of righteousness. I think that's what Paul had in mind, and he counted it a privilege to, to identify with the suffering of Jesus. That's how I would interpret that text. Does God change His mind, for instance, when He gave Hezekiah 15 more years? Uh, does God relent? Does God change His mind? Dr. Thomas? Uh, well, the Bible says He does. Um, he says one thing and then reneges and, and does another. He, he says, for example, in Samuel that he regrets um, that he had made Saul king. And uh, some commentators that I read suggested that you can't uh, regret something uh, unless you're not clear what the eventual outcome will be from the start, uh, and that therefore this proves that God is not omniscient, uh, and that there are aspects of the future um, that are closed to God. Uh, open theists, for example, make much of these passages. Um, but clearly, it, it, it's an issue of interpretation. You, you can't interpret a passage like that or a reference to God repenting or regretting or changing His mind uh, 
um, to suggest that God isn't omniscient. Omniscience is a definition of what God is. Uh, and, and therefore, one, one, one has to find some interpretation of passages like that um, in another direction. My own preference is pretty much to take Calvin's interpretation of these passages uh, and to use the language of accommodation. Um, God is uh, speaking to us in terms that we can understand. The purposes of God are beyond our understanding. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And for God to, to communicate to us as puny, tiny creatures in space and time, um, He must use baby talk, uh, to use Calvin's uh, phrase. Um, and what on the surface appears to be God changing His mind. From the perspective of God, no, this was His intention all along, but He's teaching us something uh, in the process. But uh, I, I think the way to go personally on these passages is to use the idea of God accommodating to our finitude. Yes, and we know that <clears throat> the language of the Bible is anthropomorphic, meaning that it comes to us in human form. This is part of the accommodation. And you'll note that most of those passages that are so problematic about God changing His mind or repenting or relenting are found in the narratives uh, where the narrator is uh, describing God in, in this human way. And yet at the same time, the didactic passages remind us God is not a man, that He should repent or that He should relent. And there is a cardinal rule of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation is that you interpret the narratives by the didactic, not the didactic by the narrative. And that, if you follow that, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble, I think. When church leaders become involved in sin, how does one understand this in light of the sovereignty of God? What's that? When church leaders become involved in sin, when were they not? Next. <laughs> Can a person intervene in circumstances or situations that would result in a change of outcomes? And would this change in outcomes be a change in the sovereign will of God? In other words, can we do anything that would change an outcome? And if so, how is God's will sovereign in that situation? If we say that God is sovereign, the answer to that question is obvious, isn't it? Now, the day I watched, I was held wrapped in attention watching television with the rescue of that dog in Los Angeles. How many of you saw that on TV? Oh, it was one of the most dramatic rescues I've ever seen. This poor dog got caught up in the, in the, uh, uh, the canal there and the rapids and couldn't get out. The firemen tried to wade in, but the rapids would take the dog faster away from them than they could get to him. Finally, they brought in a helicopter, dropped the guy down by a cable, and he rescued the dog while the dog was biting him and everything. It was a wonderful thing. And everybody was excited because it looked like the outcome was going to be the sure destruction of that dog until that deus ex machina, in this case, the fireman from the sky, comes down into the water, captures this uh, dog and brings it to safety. And so there we see right before our eyes the apparent change of outcome. And yet we would say that this was the sovereign act of God all along. I mean, God knows the end from the beginning, and He ordains not only the ends that He ordains, but He ordains the means to bring those ends to pass. But if we think that we can thwart or overcome the sovereignty of God, then in the, by clear implication, that makes us sovereign, not God. I mean, you hear that all the time. People say, God's sovereignty ends where man's freedom begins. That's blasphemy. Now, your freedom ends 
where God's sovereignty begins. You're free, and God is free, and God's a little more free than you are, or than I am. I hope that helps. That was a good answer. Regarding the question of God not changing, prior to the, hu the incarnation, God didn't have a human nature, but after the ascension, God in heaven, the second person of the Trinity, does have a human nature. I think the, after the incarnation, I think it's meant to say, God does have a human nature. Isn't that quite a change for Jesus not to have a human nature and then to have a human nature? How would you answer that? Uh, yes, it is. It's, it's, it's not a change in His, in his deity, um, in the incarnation. Um, Jesus' deity remains deity. It, it is not incarnation by subtraction. It's not incarnation by removing certain attributes of God with all deference to Wesley's great hymn, He Emptied Himself of All But Love. I'm not sure what that means, but I think it's just a piece of sentimentality. But if, if you exegete the theology, it is decidedly wrong. But um, Jesus remains deity, but, it, but it's incarnation by addition. In addition to His deity, He becomes uh, a man. And that, that humanity remains with Him uh, forever. Um, so, Yes, from that point of view, I'm not sure where, where the question then wants, wants us to well, go. His, his divine nature is the nature that's immutable, and that doesn't change. Why does the doctrine of reprobation have to encompass the majority of men versus the minority? In other words, why aren't more people saved? It, 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 begs, it begs the question whether, that, whether that's true. Um, and I think had you lived in the 17th century, um, many of the Puritans, for example, would have not drawn that conclusion. Um, statistically, of course, you may ask, um, how would it ever be possible that there are more saved than lost? Because at any one time, Christianity always appears to have been in the minority. And the answer to that is twofold. One, there are those who have believed that all children who die in infancy go to heaven. Uh, our own confession, the Westminster Confession at least, says all elect children, which actually is amounting to saying nothing, um, because of course elect children go to heaven. I think the reason they said that was because they couldn't find a, a Bible text to, to prove that all children who die in infancy go to heaven. Now, some of the Westminster divines certainly believed that all children who die in infancy do go to heaven. And of course, prior to, I guess, prior to the 20th century, most, most of humanity died in infancy. It's only in the last 100, 150 years that that has not been true. Uh, infant mortality, for example, in the 17th century was enormous. Uh, John Owen had 11 children, 10 of them died in infancy. Uh, and the one who survived to adulthood died in her mid-20s. Um, and then you have the likes of, um, I guess, B.B. Warfield, uh, who would suggest from eschatological perspectives that the end times when the knowledge of the glory of God shall cover as the waters cover the sea means a post-millennial interpretation of the end times, that that too statistically would beg the question. Now, I, I, I don't find this discussion terribly um, edifying. Um, I'm just amazed that one individual is saved uh, because it would have taken 
the blood of Jesus to do so. Um, and, and therefore, to, to ask why are there more lost than saved, um, again, I, I, think, I think that reverence asks the opposite question. Why does God save any at all? The, the unspoken assumption is that there's something wrong with God's grace if more people aren't saved, as if He hasn't done enough to redeem us. Uh, I would hate to stand on the judgment day and look God in the face and say, why haven't you done more to provide for our salvation? I mean, it terrifies me to even ask a question like that. Can you talk about the difference between assurance, true assurance, and false assurance? Um, what are the distinctions, and how, how would you describe those two realities? Well, false assurance is uh, people are sure of something that doesn't correspond to reality, and there are people who are sure that they're going to heaven who are not on their way to heaven. There are two primary reasons for that. The first one is that, that kindles false assurance of salvation is to have an incorrect understanding of what salvation involves or uh, requires. You know, the average view in America is that everybody goes to heaven when they die, and it's justification by death. And so, if, if everybody who dies go to heaven, and if I'm a buddy, then obviously I'm going to go to heaven too, because everybody else is. Or, I believe that if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, and I've basically lived a good life, then I'll go to heaven, so I have that uh, assurance, completely uh, based on a wrong understanding of how we are justified and how we enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so the first way in which a person can have a false sense of security, a false sense of salvation, is because they don't understand what salvation involves. The second one is that <clears throat> uh, they have a false understanding of the state of their own soul. Um, one of the things that really scares me is that in our zeal to win people to Christ, we use a lot of evangelistic techniques to try to prime the pump, to try to move them into the kingdom. Say the sinner's prayer, come to the altar, raise your hand. And what this does is gets people to make professions of faith. But professing faith has never saved anybody. You have to possess it. But if I believe that because I signed a card or said a prayer or walked up the aisle that I'm in a state of salvation, well, again, I have a false sense of what salvation requires, but I also have a false sense of where I am in my own life. I, I still may have no faith whatsoever. I'll be numbered with those people at the last day who say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus is going to say to them, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And so I think you have to… Here's where it's… To have true assurance, you really have to understand the gospel, and you have to get the gospel in your bloodstream. And when their doubts come, you have to cling to the gospel and its promises with your fingernails if necessary, and understand that your only hope in life and death is Christ who has, uh, who has saved me. Then we can have authentic assurance, but anything less than that is suspect. There are two issues here. One is subjective and one is objective. Uh, on the subjective side, John Owen said there are two principal pastoral problems. Convincing the unbeliever that he's under bondage to sin, and convincing the believer that he's not. For Owen, most of pastoral work comes in one or two of those areas. On the objective side, in order for assurance to be true assurance, there must be a true and clear gospel. If we're uncertain as to what the gospel is, if we dilute 
the message of the gospel. If the gospel is find the inner strength within yourself, um, if, the, if the gospel um, is syncretistic, it can mean this and this and this and this, even though all four of them are contradictory. Um, then, then there are problems with false assurance. So, so we inherit false assurance from false gospels, from easy believism, um, and I think it's it's in, it's pandemic within the modern Christian church. Um, it is frightening uh, to ask the question: Can you tell me what the gospel is in two minutes? And and to to wait with bated breath for the answer, um, because even in, our, even in our evangelical and Reformed churches, um, we need to make sure that we are preaching the, the gospel and know what it is and know what it's not. Can you summarize the gospel in 30 seconds? This is, this is you. <laughs> 30 seconds. The good news is that in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, all of our sins are imputed to Him for which He paid an atonement that perfectly satisfies the uh, justice of God, and also in His perfect life of obedience, He achieved a righteousness that is imputed to all of those who embrace Him by faith alone. Objectively, the gospel is the person and work of Christ, the benefits of which are subjectively appropriated by faith and by faith alone. The gospel is Christ. His work, I receive it by faith. Related to the gospel, there was a document that came out toward the end of, uh, end of last year, uh, put out by a coalition of uh, leaders uh, from different uh, traditions and, and historical backgrounds, and uh, this document is called the Manhattan Declaration. Um, they were concerned with some ethical social issues, um, namely the sanctity of human life, sanctity of marriage, uh, and the distinction between church and state, and keeping the intrusion um, uh, from the state from getting involved in the church. Um, but they framed it in the context of gospel partnership. Um, both of you have not signed this. Why did you choose not to sign this document? Well, <clears throat> I don't know anybody that's been more passionate uh, in speaking against uh, abortion on demand than I have. I've written a whole volume on it. And I strongly affirm the sanctity of marriage as well. And the, the overwhelming uh, central motif of this document was to speak against abortion and for the sanctity of life and the sanctity of marriage and those things. And I have always said that I am willing to be a co-belligerent with the devil on common grace issues. I would march with the devil if he would carry a banner against abortion, as long as I don't have to call him a Christian. And as long as we don't confuse issues of special grace with common grace. And the issue of special grace that is the most volatile issue in the world today is the meaning of the gospel. And this particular declaration was a unified statement that included people who not only don't believe the gospel, but are members of communions that have classically, clearly, not only repudiated the gospel, but have condemned the gospel. And so when we say that we're working in unity on the gospel with these people, there's no way in the world I could sign a document like that. I mean, I agree with all the common grace statements, Chris, but when they got muddled by mixing in these special grace things, then I had to demur. Is there a cause for co-belligerency that would, you would find legitimate? Uh, sure. I, I, think, I think that abortion is wrong um, 
on other grounds other than uh, gospel grounds. Um, I didn't sign it because I wasn't asked to sign it. Um, that may say how, how well, it probably says more about me than anything else. But, um, but having read it, I, I, I can see, you know, the word Christian can be used in a broad sense, meaning he's not Jewish or Islamic or whatever. He's civilized. Um, but, but gospel, that's, that's another issue for me. And I think that um, I, I could not have signed the document. Um, the, 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 language, um, the language was too specific to, to what is unique, and that is the gospel. And there were <laughs> members who belong to other faiths and communions that, uh, with whom I, have, I, I, I do not share um, a commonality as far as the gospel is concerned. And, um, you know, having served, for example, in Northern Ireland for 17 years, um, where a Protestant understanding of the gospel and a Catholic understanding of the gospel um, was, a, was a, a, a frequent issue. Um, Yes, I, I did stand for co-belligerency with Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland, but not on the platform of the gospel, but on, on, a, on a humanitarian platform, that this, this is wrong from humanitarian considerations, not because his gospel is the same as mine, because it isn't. His gospel sends people to hell. Sorry, but that's what I think. Um, and, and I think to… to to fudge that um, is, is, a, is, a, is a costly thing to do. Dr. Sproul, does God speak to every person He brings into existence personally about His salvation? In other words, does, does God give an opportunity for everyone to be saved? I have very little reason to hope for that. The, uh, God speaks clearly to every person of His own being. God reveals Himself, as Paul teaches in Romans 1, to all people, and that that revelation gets through of who He is. But universally, as fallen creatures, we uh, suppress that truth and we refuse to acknowledge the God whom we know exists, we refuse to honor Him as God, nor are we grateful. So we get just enough knowledge there to condemn us. But the gospel is not in that general revelation. The gospel is communicated through special revelation, through the preaching of the Word. And there are lots of folks who have never heard that Word. But again, you have to understand that Christ came into a world that was already completely under the judgment of God. That's what Paul labors in the first couple of chapters of Romans to set the background for the wonderful good news of the gospel, is that Christ came into a world that was already under judgment. And it remains under judgment. That's why we have the great commission to communicate the gospel to every living creature in the world. You know, I think if we ask the question, and we do ask the question, all of us ask the question, why, why do some hear the gospel and others don't? But, but the burden of our answer must never be to cast aspersions on God, but to ask ourselves, what are we doing to make that gospel known? You know, Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples. And if, if we are really burdened, why are there some who don't hear the gospel? And there are some who don't hear the gospel in our neighborhoods, let alone on the other side of the world. You know, I think that should, that should speak to us as to our own zeal for evangelism, um, because every day God gives us opportunities to speak for Christ that we don't utilize. Um, you know, I was, I, I was, my breath was taken away. 
I hate all this business of um, airport security. And you do too. Mm -hmm. Only you have one of these fancy cards that lets they, you in the back door. They got rid of that. Oh. They don't have that card anymore. Well, <laughs> I'm in line one day. You know, you have to... Uh, it, it's best to go almost semi-naked. <laughs> and definitely with no shoes, because it's, it's just such a hassle to you, take you all this... You have a knee replacement. <laughs> Then you carry a card. Oh, I thought that card, they say terrorists get those cards. That doesn't convince anybody of anything. The man in front of me, um, you know, when they check your, your ID and stuff, he says, where are you going? And just like that, he said, well, ultimately I'm going to heaven, but today I'm going to wherever it was he was going. <laughs> and in about 15, 20 seconds, in a, in a very polite way, he preached the gospel to this man. It was, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It wasn't offensive. Um, he, the, the guy thanked him. He didn't, he didn't take offense, but it was, it was just an opportunity. And, you know, I, I thought to myself, I wouldn't even have thought of, of answering like that. <laughs> anyway. Well, the security to get to heaven is a lot harder than it is to get to <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> Then you will have to go through naked. <laughs> Briefly here at the end, one last question. I'd like to hear from both of you. Uh, what's the biggest challenge, or another way to put it, what's the biggest opportunity for the church in the 21st century? Well, let me answer so that my dear friend can, can close. Um, I, I think... I think the gospel is still our greatest challenge, um, defining it, defining it positively and negatively, um, being sure of what it is. Uh, e even, even in our churches and our denominations where we, we talk a lot about the gospel, um, error never sleeps and Satan never sleeps. And um, I, I think it's still our greatest challenge to uphold um, the purity um, of the gospel. And in order to do that, you have to be prepared to suffer. It's what this conference is about. You know, part of take up your cross and follow me is being prepared to defend the gospel even when it is self-evident that there may be those who are your friends even, uh, who, who are not clear as to what it is. Um, that, that would be my main thought on that. When you asked that question, the first thing that came to my mind was the gospel. You know, think back to the motto of the Reformation was post Tenebras looks after darkness, light. And I think if we were to write the epitaph for our culture today, it would be post lux tenebros, after light, darkness. The darkness threatens the gospel in every generation. Luther said that if you preach the gospel clearly and boldly, it will inevitably bring conflict, and we don't want conflict. And so we try to find softer ways to preach the gospel. And we tell people the gospel is the good news, that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's true. Or the gospel is that you can have a purpose, purposeful life. That may be true as well. Or that God loves you. That also may be true, maybe isn't. But none of those things are the gospel. My personal testimony is not the gospel. It's only a testimony of what the gospel has done for me. The gospel, as you said earlier, is objective, and it has to do with the person and work of Christ and how that work is appropriated. And so I think, you know, the big theological issues of our day are Christological, the person of Christ, as it relates to the gospel. And uh, people, don't, people are fighting against imputation. They're fighting against the perfect act of obedience of Jesus. All of these fights touch the very heart of the gospel itself. And I, I saw the great confusion in the American church 
in the initiative called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, that so clearly revealed to me that in the strongest areas of evangelicalism, there was vast confusion about what the gospel is and what it isn't. And we really have our work cut out for us, I think, to, to recover the gospel for our age. Let's thank our speakers.